And wakeboarding in particular, I mean, it can be a violent impact with the water. I mean, if, if you've ever tubed or done anything behind a boat, you hit the water going 30 miles an hour, it can knock you out, knock mm-hmm. you silly, uh, discombobulate you, or whatever the word is for that. I like the I like discombobulate. <laughs> discombobulate. Yeah. Said that, pronounced that. I'm surprised. So, <laughs> yes. The award-winning Tennessee Wildcast is on the air with the latest on hunting, fishing, boating, wildlife watching, and all things outdoors. Make welcome your host, drummer and outdoor expert novice, Jason Harmon. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Tennessee Wildcast. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We're glad you're joining us today. we got a fun show for you. We're on the water right here in front of the Master Craft boat, boat Manufacturing Facility. So it's going to be a fun show. I'm excited to have our special guest, and uh, we're going to talk about a little bit of partnership, and then we're going to talk boating safety. It's National Safe Boating Week. And we want to make sure we hit that home today. So with us, we have Jeff Roberson, David Holt, David right there in the middle, and then Leanna Warner, the production manager here at Mastercraft. So thank you guys for being with us. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. I think this might be the first time you guys have been on, right? I've, I've been on the past for some uh, stuff at Fall Creek Falls, That's I believe. Right. That's right, yeah. I so was on in the past when it was, before it was Wildcast, it was, what was it called? Ah, wild, uh, wild something. Okay, it's it a long time ago. But gotcha, for, gotcha. for both of us, first time this year. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad y'all are here. We'll have to do this again. Um, but these guys are out on the water every year, you know, keeping us safe and and uh, patrolling the water. And we're going to talk boating safety today. But also, I wanted to bring Leanne in with us today to uh, Leanna to talk about the partnership that that she kind of came up with, and and it was kind of her brainchild. So, tell us about yourself real quick, Leanna, and let's talk a little bit about this. All right, so my name is Leanna Warner. I'm the production manager here at Mastercraft in beautiful Von Orr, Tennessee. Yes. Um, I am a big hunter in the in the winter, of course, and was at the Becoming an Outdoors Woman event at Buffalo Ridge, uh, the muzzleloader uh, hunt in November. Looking around, I was like, man, this would be really cool if we could get Mastercraft and TWRA partnered up. We both have safety as, as our top priorities mm-hmm. on the water, and so I thought it was just a, a logical connection. Um, so I'm really happy to have you guys out here, and I look forward to what we can bring to the community and to ensure that we get the word about how to be safe and how to have fun on the water. Yeah, awesome. So real quick, the most important thing, did you ha- harvest a deer at that hunt? I did not. Oh, no. So I need to go back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll see if we can arrange that, get Thank you back out there. Uh, but I think that's a great idea. Thank you for for bringing that up or for you know taking charge to try to get this partnership going you reached out to david i believe it was and kind of got us connected yeah he was at the chattanooga boat show i was there with my family and had the idea and um kind of had talked about it with my boss here at work and you know he's like yeah go ahead and investigate what we could do and so mm-hmm. saw them at the uh, setup at the boat show and saw talk stopped and talked to him to get a contact information and started the ball rolling yeah that's awesome put her in contact with uh, mimi barnes yep and she's great at her job and was able to really uh, assist with uh putting it all together making it happen Mm -hmm. yeah y'all got to do a tour not long ago and uh check out the facility i missed that tour but uh just tell us a little bit about the boats and then we'll jump into some boating safety what uh, when you're looking at a Mastercraft, are we looking at bass boats or ski boats, wake boats? What are we looking at? Here? Yeah, they're they're the world class uh, wake boats. I mean, they're they're handmade, start to finish, top to bottom. Um, very proud of what we do here at Mastercraft, and we're really the you know world class in, in everything uh, from competitions to to having boats with families. Yeah. Um, so, really, a, a proud to make this product um, and proud to promote the safety how to, how to use our product safely yeah awesome well i think it's a it's a beautiful boat uh and your team is is in charge of making sure all the finished and touches are on there right yeah, yeah. we we in, uh, assemble every piece of everything that goes into those boats from the decals to the upholstery uh my team also makes the trailers everything is is done by hand here and it's something we're very proud of and they go out all around the world all around the world wow well, I appreciate you jumping in here. We're gonna we're gonna uh, have you back uh, on part two of this uh, this show, and we're gonna uh, talk more about the partnership and what all goes on here in this facility. So, uh, thank you for jumping in for yep. this for this segment. Thank we're you. gonna bring Matt 
uh, Cameron in with us. Matt Cameron is our information and education. I said information and education. That's changed. Outreach and communications uh, coordinator uh, in Region 4, and he's going to help us continue the conversation around boating safety. Matt, thank you for coming in here. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I spent the first uh, about 10 years of my career as a boating enforcement officer in the position that Jeff's in now, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Cut my teeth on the Knoxville waterfront and uh, survived the Neyland Stadium debacle, so <laughs> I'm here. They, I guess they promoted me for it. So Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah we probably ought not go into that whole <laughs> story. We won't talk about that today. <laughs> um, but, yeah, uh, so this time of year, people are on the water. It's firing up. It's getting hot. Uh, a lot of stuff's going on out there, uh, and people need to be safe. Um, I want to jump in, first of all, uh, since we're standing in front of a wakebo wakeboard boat or a surf boat here, um, there's been some changes in the rules or in the laws about uh, wakeboarding and, and wake surfing uh, near shore banks and things like that. Will you, one of you touch on that and what the, some of the changes have been and uh, get that out there first, and then we're going to jump into more of the safety stuff too. Sure. Uh, that law goes into effect uh, July 1st of this year. So it affects wake surfing and wakeboarding boats. Um, basically the law says if the waterway is not uh, 400 feet, or larger, then you cannot wake surf or wake board in that area. Also, uh, if you if it is w larger than that or wider, you can surf and wake uh, board in that area, but you have to be 200 feet away from the shoreline as well as docks and any other type of structures. Okay. And, there, and 400 feet is a lot less than you, you, than you think. You, you, yeah. you think it's a lot, but it's a lot less than, than what you actually think it is. You, you just have to do a little bit more pre-planning before you go out there and uh, do your wake surfing and wakeboarding. Yeah. What's know a good way to, to identify that distance? I mean, we, we hunt. We know what about 300 feet is, uh, 100 yards. Yeah. What's a, an easy way to, for people to, to judge that? Four basketball courts. <laughs> four, four, either, either that or a uh, football field with the end zones and then, and then some a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. So – but uh, Google Earth has great measurement tools. To, oh, okay. Like I said, with pre-planning, you can do some uh, Google Earth me measuring in the areas that you're planning on going. That way you kind of have an idea on what your what your path should be for that mm -hmm. day. And it's it, and the only reason this law is coming in is just to, with the amount of more, more and more boaters we have, the amount of more wakeboarders we have, it's it creates uh, possible property damage and erosion to our shorelines. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's a great time for this partnership to kind of come together. You know, we we love, we want people to go out there and have fun and do these kind of sports that they, that they love to do. But it's also about being safe and respecting the other guys out there, the other people, the other docks, the, the landowners, you know, they're up, you know, in those waterways. So that's, that's good. Um, another thing that we got here, um, got to have that uh, personal flotation device that's U.S. Coast Guard approved, right? Correct. Um you also have to have, I'm oh, sorry, you can't wake surf or wake board between sunset and sunrise. Okay. And that was already in the law, but they strengthen it even more now saying no water sports at night. Gotcha. So between sunset and sunrise. And, and the, the U.S. Coast Guard approved, uh, I know for some people, is a, how do you know if your life jacket's Coast Guard approved? Every single life jacket on the inside of it, it's, just, it's got a stamp from the factory that will say whether it's Coast Guard approved or not. Why is that important? People are like, what does it matter? It floats. There are some uh, flotation aids that are not Coast Guard approved, and those, uh, if the person's knocked unconscious, those flotation aids will not float them. You still have to be moving your arms and legs. So on the Coast Guard approved life jackets that we're talking about, even if you're knocked unconscious, you know, in some type of water sports, you're still going to float even without moving your arms and legs. So that's the difference there. Yeah, and, and even, even those, those Coast Guard approved jackets, a lot of them keep your head up right depending on the top yeah it will actually float you face up which mm -hmm. is very important yeah. um, for your life yeah if you were to be knocked unconscious correct and wake boarding in particular i mean it can be a violent impact with the water i mean if, if you've ever tubed or done anything behind a boat you hit the water going 30 miles an hour it can knock you out knock mm -hmm. you silly uh discombobulate you or whatever the word is for that i like the <laughs> i like discombobulate discombobulate yeah. said that pronounced that i'm surprised so <laughs> yes Face up in the water is mm -hmm. important, but those seem to be the ones that, in my experience, that people didn't like to wear because they were the, bulky and cumbersome. The, they're a little more uncomfortable, but so is you know, a, it, so it, is a coffin. Yeah, it's yeah. It is a uh, is it worth your life? You know, that's the question you gotta 
You're way. absolutely right. Yeah. Well, and while we're on life jackets, there's all kinds of different types. You got uh, the inflatables now that folks like to wear. The fishermen really like the inflatables. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't get in the way of casting and whatnot. And some ladies say the belt pack inflatables are good for the tan lines. I don't, I don't, I don't do the tan <laughs> line thing, but. Um, you know, those are available, but there's certain restrictions on those age age restrictions. What's that? Do you remember what the age restrictions are on the inflatable jackets? 16 and older. And if you're unsure, um, read the label. There actually are a few that uh, are legal through Coast Guard certification for younger than that, but the majority of them okay. are 16 or older. But check your label. That's what's going to give you that but idea. They are not approved for this type of activity, though, correct? Correct. Right. right. So any type of water sports, um, if it requires a life jacket, it needs to be an inherently buoyant, meaning it's already got flotation, doesn't have to be inflated. Gotcha. gotcha. Explain what wake surfing is for people that don't know what that means. Yeah, I've, I've never done it, but I think I've seen it. Wake surfing, and, you know, I'm sure that some of the wake surfers out there will, you know, would love to add more on it. Yeah. But it it's essentially uh, does not have any rope or anything involved. You are simply uh, following behind riding the actual wave or wake that's being produced by the uh, vessel. And it's it's a more low speed uh, sport, but it it inherently causes a lot of wake, which is the pleasure in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's become extremely popular over the past few years. And so these wakeboard boats have ballast tanks in them. They actually pump water, lake water, into them to let the boat sit lower and create, create a, a larger wave. wave. Uh -huh, okay. Just like surfing on the ocean, you're back there surfing on that wave that your your boat uh, produces. Okay. Wow. That's, that's pretty cool. So, I mean, it sounds a little dangerous to me, too. But, but it, I mean, you're really close to the back of that boat. But it's a, it's an inboard engine, correct? Correct. And, uh, and, and many of the uh, inboard engines nowadays are that they're designed so well that carbon monoxide is still something to be thoughtful of, but mm. nowhere near as concerning as what it was, you know, a number of years in the past. Yeah. So, uh, main takeaways, uh, check out this new this new law, know, know where you can be, you know, how far away from a residence or from a dock or from a bank, um, wear that life jacket, U.S. Coast Guard approved life jacket, and just be careful out there. Uh, be that, mindful yeah. of your wake. I mean, you're still yeah. responsible for your wake. Is that correct, Jeff? Correct, yeah. Um, if your wake damages, even if you're outside that 200 feet, you're still going to be responsible for those damages. So... Try and find those areas that are less populated or where there's not a lot of boaters, not a lot of already people wakeboarding in that area. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, um, here's a good question. Are there any uh, significant areas that this uh, in the state that this law will not affect, not affect boaters? There, they did add into that law um, bodies of water under 50 acres, no wakeboarding, no wake surfing. Okay. I don't know of any in my immediate area. Um, the main lakes we have, the core lakes and the TV lakes, are far bigger than that. Sure. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, as, as far as the smaller, the only places I see that affecting are the smaller creeks, the really narrow channels, uh, these big main channels, far far larger than 400 feet. Mm -hmm. And well, like I said, it just comes down to, in some instances, you might have to do a little bit more planning, and instead of surfing or uh, skiing your way to your spot, you might just have to ride over there and then begin your activity rather than yeah, that's get, great advice. Rather, rather than doing your activity on the way gotcha. to the area. Find the place on your lake where it's conducive, it's friendly to the shoreline, to other boaters, and then wait till you get to that point to start your activity. That's good. And Make, our first yeah. year on this, it's new to us too, so sure. we're learning as we go. And the legislature put that law in effect for a safety issue and for uh, public safety as well as property. But we are, uh, for the first year, we're going to do a lot of education more, mm -hmm. that, more than enforcement. So um, if you get stopped for that, most likely it'll just be, hey, we got to fix this. We can't be in this area anymore. Right. Well, and uh, talking about planning, I think about the float plan. Uh, we've said that before on the show. We, we hear that in the agency, have a float plan. What is a float plan? And I would say make that this planning part of that. It, it's It can be a part of it. Uh, a float plan is... You know, it doesn't have to be a very complex, you know, written out formal document. It could be as simple as you sending a text message to a friend or a loved one. Hey, I'm going to be here doing this for this long. I expect to be back at this time. Here's who I'm with. And it's just that way if something happens out there to you, uh, first responders, A, have a uh, somewhere where to start. Mm -hmm. And they know who they're looking for. Yeah. And, you know, and 
rather than having a missing persons three or four days later, you know, we're able to get a little bit more uh, proactive in the in the search. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's great, great information. And it kind of goes along with hunting, too, have a hunt plan. If you're going out in the woods, let folks know I'm going to this WMA or I'm going to this piece of property to, to hunt. I will be in a tree stand, you know, be back by then. So that's that's great, great stuff. All right, so um, safety features. Um, we all need our safety requirements on the boats. You want to cover some of that today about what, what's required on, on boats? Yeah, every motorized vessel um, is required and even some motorized required uh, to have safety equipment so from a kayak all the way up to you know use large house house boats uh, there needs to be a life jacket on board for each person okay uh, if that person's under the age of 13 they have to be wearing their life jacket um, if the vessel has uh, enclosed fuel tanks they're required to have a fire extinguisher the bigger the boat the more fire extinguishers they got to have so all that's available on our website and uh, we have boating safety handbooks as well um, if the boat's motorized or sail driven, has to have that registration. Doesn't fall under safety per se, but um, if we find an empty boat, we know who we're looking for by mm -hmm. running that registration. Uh, what am I missing? Uh, I was going to touch up a little more on uh, paddlecraft. We're we've seen a huge increase in the amount of paddlecraft people uh, enjoying our waterways, and it's great to see them out there. But uh, they're required to have a life jacket on their vessel but they're not legally required to wear it unless they're 12 and under. But we've seen, and Jeff, I'm sure you could uh, echo me on this, we've seen a, a large increase in the amount of fatalities that we work uh, across the state with um, paddlecraft. And oftentimes, whether they have it on their vessel or, or not, they weren't wearing it, mm -hmm. the, the, the uh, PDUP or the PFD. Yeah. And it's it, just like a seatbelt in the car, it's only... It's only going to help you if you wear it. Yeah. And then we talk about paddle craft. We're talking about kayaks, canoes, stand-up uh, paddle boards, anything that's man-powered. Uh, even your small john boats and um, row boats would be considered your paddle craft. And we see those on the main lakes as well as in the, in the smaller creeks and rivers. Um, it's a great, great way to get outdoors, go fishing and recreate, mm -hmm. but still have to follow those safety guidelines. Yeah. Yep, and even the inflatable ones, <laughs> as we talked about before, those inflatable kayaks and things like that. I was going to add to your uh, your list of required equipment. If your boat's 16 feet long or longer, you have to have the top four throwable device. And I never understood why that, that is boat 16 feet long and longer because I saw more people fall out of smaller boats. I wish it would apply to all boats. So mm -hmm. even though you don't have to have it in a 15 or 14 foot boat, have a type four throwable device in there and explain what the type four is people have no idea what i'm talking about the, the, the top four is it, it's your square throw cushion or your um or, or, the, or the or the ring the donut ring and I, and I often have people ask me well is a life jacket not good enough that i can just toss a life jacket and i always have to tell them that no it's not the uh the top four throw cushions are designed and weighted a little bit differently than just your standard uh, life jacket to where they can be thrown with ease and make it out a certain distance rather than a standard life jacket is just going to go a few feet in front of you. It's going to catch the wind and it's, it's going to sink or uh, it's going to get on the water right 10, 15 feet in front of you maybe. Mm -hmm. Whereas you can really toss a uh, Type 4 out to someone that's in distress. It's kind of like throwing a Frisbee yeah. versus if you throw a regular life jacket throw in a cardboard box. It just doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. yeah. You know, that Frisbee, you can fling it several yards. And that does not count as a wearable no. device. How many times right. have y'all seen people try to put that thing on right. their back and, and wear if it? If you read the label, it's big, bold letters, do not wear on back. Yeah. The reason <laughs> for that is if they enter the water, they're fl they're floating face down. Yeah. So got to have a wearable on board for each person we talk about. And then if 16 feet or greater, like you said, just a th one throwable. Yeah. But they're relatively inexpensive at the store. Yeah. And, and in my opinion, one of the more uh, useful things you can have on board your vessel because that's the only thing you can really chuck out to someone to, that could save their life. Yeah. What's some of the most common safety violations that you see? We talk about this equipment that you need and things that you want to make sure is on board, but what's what's some of the most common violations that you guys see out there that you want to drive home? Uh, Safety-wise, that equipment now is a good time to check. It's mm. beginning of summer. It's a good time to go through and make sure you have enough and that they're – in good and serviceable condition I and mean, all the buckles buckle up the zippers work you, they fit the intended wear so you're not putting an adult jacket on a child um, 
after that set all year, you know, it might be moldy, might be torn, might have a rat's nest in it. Get through there and replace that stuff and make sure it works. Uh, we didn't cover lighting, but if you're you're boating between sunset and sunrise at night, check those lights before you go to the lake. Mm -hmm. Make sure they're working. Make part of that your float plan. Yeah. Correct. Check all uh, that. Check, especially your first time out this summer, you want to go through that stuff uh, pretty thoroughly to make sure it's all working. Yeah. Well, something we were discussing uh, before the show was the fire extinguisher and the and the onboard extinguish system. You you kind of joked around, but it's it's not a joke. I mean, even if your boat has that extinguish extinguisher in the tank area it's always good to have that handheld Correct. on so board as well boats like this mastercraft they uh, they come with an onboard halon system that halon, okay. automatically um or you can push a button manually but most of them are automatic if a fire breaks out in the engine compartment it will extinguish it, mm -hmm. it there's an onboard it's a big fancy system um that's great if you have a fire in the uh, engine compartment and that meets the legal requirements for uh, the state law but if you have a fire elsewhere, you know, electrical may be under the dash or, or somewhere other than the engine compartment, you're going to sit and watch your boat burn because you don't have a handheld extinguisher. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good idea to go ahead and put one or two of those on your boat as well. Yeah. $20 could save a thirty-five, dollars $350,000 boat or whatever it may be. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's uh, it's it's smart. <laughs> there's there's a lot of just common violations we're still on we're still on that subject. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, one we stop a lot for is uh, called reckless operation. And it's people sitting in areas they shouldn't be going down the lake, you know, on the very back, the swim deck, or, you know, dangling their feet off the front. Um, there's seating charts on these boats that says safe seating area while underway. Mm -hmm. When you're out drifting, hanging out, recreating at anchor, you can be anywhere and all, all over that boat. But once the boat gets underway and is going down the lake, Gotta gotta get your butt down inside a seat somewhere. Mm -hmm. That's a huge violation that um, we see a lot of. Awesome, that's good stuff. Um, all right, well, just kind of on that same line, tell us how people can be safe on the water. What's you know, uh, having that float plan, being prepared with your safety equipment, mm -hmm. having a all uh, children twelve and under in a life jacket at all times. That they they get fussy, uh, and we understand that, but. It's uh, it, it could save their life, and uh, have a sober operator, not 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 one that's uh only gonna have one beer. Let's keep one that's only gonna have zero beers. Right. You know, mm -hmm. ha having a safe sober operator, and that's unless you can think of anything else, Jeff. Yeah, uh, I like to harp on the BUI. That's one of my passions is is removing as many impaired operators from the lake as I can. Um, majority of our crashes. Uh, or not, maybe not caused by alcohol, but almost every accident we work involves alcohol. Somebody mm -hmm. in either party has been consuming. Um, so, it, you know, it, it, it inhibits your judgment, um, your coordination, your balance, all those things. It slows you, your reaction time. You need a lot of those, all of those you need to drive a boat because yeah. you've got a lot going on, uh, just like driving a car. Yeah, and, and then when you leave the water, you're in a car. Correct. I mean, a drunk um, boater is a drunk driver. did mm -hmm. want to mention, too, this... Uh, Last year, the legislature actually enhanced our BUI penalties to come in line with the DUI penalties. So uh, DUI, BUI are treated exactly the same now. The, the penalties are, are fairly extensive and just not worth that arrest. Yeah. One thing that always surprised me about boaters and alcohol is they just didn't see it as being dangerous, as dangerous as driving a car impaired. They go to the lake to unwind and have a good time, and, and, and we do. But, you know, it's a whole different beast and you talked about all the stressors that come along with it, and there's no lanes of traffic out there. Boats are coming from all directions, so alcohol affects you worse on the water. You talked about the, the wave action, and um, it's just it can be even more dangerous than driving a car to you, me. Just you, you, seen you, it. you expect the dangers of the roadway. You know, we're taught that since we started driving our cars, but you, you don't necessarily expect the dangers of the waterway because you're out here to have fun, not mm -hmm. to not to get hurt, and that's mm -hmm. – you know that 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 uh, uh, bit of ignorance can be hurtful. Yeah. And a vehicle, you've got seat belts, you've got airbags, um, you've got all these safety things built into it. And boats don't have those. Mm -hmm. We don't have airbags. You don't have seat belts. You have your life jacket, and what what goes on up here? What yeah. you do with that? Another thing to watch out for the weather, you know, make make sure you know what what's coming, what the the forecast looks like. You're out there; it's maybe sunny in the morning, but and and the the one thing that worries me is when there's the 
you didn't see it on your phone on the radar. Yeah. But you got this unexpected pop up shower that all of a sudden everybody's going to the exact same ramps and they're not really paying attention, you know, looking around. And uh, at least in our area, every time there's one of those just pop up thunderstorms, it, those are often some of the most dangerous times because everybody's out there at the exact same time and trying to go home at the exact same time. And mm-hmm. it's often that you can either, that folks either swamp or occupy the same spot on the water at the same time yeah yeah and those uh those big holiday weekends and and all those people out there those are also maybe sometimes to avoid the water but uh (laughs) but it's uh, that's when everybody wants to be out there off and uh just be careful out there when it gets crowded i joke around a lot if you see me going really really fast my patrol boat it's either a thunderstorm's coming or it's lunchtime. <laughs> I, got, I got to get somewhere to eat. <laughs> uh, well, let's wrap it up with education. Uh, TNWildlife.org is our website. All the classes are posted there, information's there. But tell folks what they can expect in a boating education class, and then we'll wrap it up from there. Yeah, so anybody born after January 1st of 1989 is required to have that license um, to operate a vessel. So uh, those classes, like you said, are listed on our website. And if you don't see one that fits your schedule, check back regular because we add them constantly. Um, but it's anywhere from a three to sometimes four or five hour classes. Mm. And you sit down, you go through all this, a lot of the stuff we talked about, we go through it in depth. Um, and they learn what to do and what not to do to keep them safe on the water and um, legal things and illegal things, what, what you don't want to be part of. Yeah. And at the end of that, they test and they get certified. Um, certified for life. Once you once you get certified, you never have to retake, and you're good to go and, operate and that vessel. And one, one thing I always tell folks in the, my classes that this class is not designed to teach you how to drive a boat. This this class is designed to give you the tools to be able to be safe on the water. But you won't. There's no way you'd be able to get out there in a brand new two hundred fifty thousand dollar really fast boat and be able to be safe with it it, t- it takes time because oh, so many of the things that we have committed the muscle memory for driving a car just they don't carry over to driving a boat there's a lot of other factors that uh that are so much different and it, and it takes time to be able to be comfortable you know driving safely and efficiently without damaging your vessel yeah yeah we can sit down and tell you how to ride a bike all day but until you do it that's when you learn same thing well guys i think we've covered a lot here today i appreciate you taking time out and joining us here on the on the lakeside uh, i think a lot of people are going to be ready to uh, or at least they're educated now and they know what to what to think about they can get a class if they need one and uh, and be safe out there on the water this summer so thanks Robin. appreciate yeah, what you do you. all right we'll see you next time this is tennessee wildcast have a good one thanks for tuning in Stay connected with TWRA by visiting our website at tnwildlife.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hey, it's all about Tennessee wildlife. It's what we do. Tennessee Wildcast will be on the air again next week. We'll see you then.